All right, we are live on YouTube, so I'll call me in order of the Beaumont City Council regular council meeting for Tuesday, April 26th, 2022 at 6 p.m. here in council chambers. So with that, I'll begin with the land acknowledgement, which we begin every meeting with, which are we are pleased to be here today on the traditional territory of Treaty 6 and the Métis homeland. We acknowledge all those who share a deep connection with this land. The city of Beaumont respects the histories, languages, and cultures of all of Canada's first peoples, whether they be a First Nation, Métis, or Inuit descent, and appreciates that their presence continues to enrich Canada's vibrant communities. We're all treaty people. The peace treaties bind us all. I do have this evening three proclamations to do. There were six last time, now I got three, so there you go. First proclamation is Municipal Clerks Week, May 1 to May 7, 2022. Whereas the Office of the Professional Municipal Clerk, a time-honored and vital part of local government that exists throughout the world, and whereas the Office of the Professional Municipal Clerk is the oldest among public servants, and whereas the Office of the Professional, professional Municipal Clerk provides a professional link between the citizens, local governing bodies, and agencies of government at all levels, and whereas professional municipal clerks have pledged to be ever mindful of their neutrality and impartiality regarding equal service to all, and whereas the Professional Municipal Clerk, Clark, Clerk, serves as the information center on functions of local government and community, and whereas professional municipal clerks continually strive to improve the administration of the affairs of the Office of Professional Municipal Clerks through participation in education programs, seminars, work workshops, and the annual meetings of the state, provincial, and county international professional organization, and whereas it is most appropriate that we recognize accomplishment of the Office of Professional Municipal Clerks. Therefore, be it resolved that I, Mayor Bill Danlick, do hereby proclaim May 1 to 7, 2022 as Municipal Clerks Week in the City of Beaumont, dated 14th of April, 2022. Workers' Compensation Board of Mourning. Workers' Compensation Board, day of mourning, April 28th, 2022. Whereas April 28th is recognized across Canada as the day to mourn victims of workplace accidents and for the renewal of the pledge to make a safer workplace. And whereas in 2021, 170 Alberta workers died from injuries or disease related to the workplace. And whereas in honoring their memory, employers and workers can make a difference by working to, together to keep each other safe every day. And whereas the city of Beaumont recognizes April 28th as a day to mourn victims of all workplace accidents and bring awareness to the, for the need to establish safe conditions in the workplace for all. Therefore, be it resolved that I, Mayor Bill Danlick, do hereby proclaim April 28th, 2022 as Workers' Compensation Day of Mourning in the city of Beaumont, Alberta, and encourage all employers and workers to recognize the importance of maintaining safe work environments dated April 19th, 2022. Lastly, <clears throat> North American Occupational Safe and Safety and Health Week, May 1 to May 7th, 2022. Whereas May 1 to 7 has been designated as this year's North American Occupational Self Safety and Health Week. And whereas National American Occupational Health and Safety Week was first launched in June 1997 and marked as an agreement between Canada United States and Mexico, and symbolizes joint venture, cooperation, and commitment to common goals shared by all the occupational health and safety partners. And whereas the goal during Safety and Health Week is to focus employers, employees, partners, and the public on the importance of preventing injury and illness in the workplace, at home, and in the community. And whereas the City of Beaumont recognized in May 1 to 7th as North American Occupational Health and Safety and Health Week to bring awareness to, for the need to establish a healthy and safe workplace for all. Therefore, be it resolved that I, Mayor Bill Danlick, do hereby proclaim May 1 to 7, 2022, as the, National, the North American Occupational Safety and Health Week in the City of Beaumont, Alberta, and encourage all the employers, workers, and members of the public on the importance of maintaining a healthy and safe work environment, dated 26th of April, 2022. Thank you. With that, we move to number two on our agenda is the adoption of the agenda. Administration, are there any changes to the agenda this evening? Ms. Winter? Thank you, Mayor. Administration does not have any adjustments to the agenda this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion from council to adopt the agenda as presented? Councilor McCook? So moved. Thank you, Councilor. Any question on the motion? Seeing none, I'll ask you all to vote accordingly. Just hang on a second. There we go. Please vote, please. That carries unanimously. Thank you, Council. 
Next on our agenda is open forum. Administration, do you have any open forum guests this evening? Ms. Winter, you have the floor. Oh, pardon me. I missed a step, I apologize. Thank you, council. We do have consent agenda. I marked off my, on my agenda, my fault. Uh, on consent agenda is three, this evening, three items. 5A, regular council meeting of April 12th, 2022. 7A, bylaw 1012-22-2222, fees and charges amendment, first, second, and third reading. And 11A, regional initiatives update. Is a member of council willing to move the consent agenda as presented? Council McCall Swain. Uh, yeah, I got a question on it. So I don't know if I can move it because I might want to punt something off. Um, so being it's clerk's week next week and one of my clerks could help me out here. Should uh, I just had a question around um, 7A there. Um, you know, we're going first, second, third reading. I don't, I don't want to, um, I don't want to pull it off and then have us make, go through all those motions, but I do have a question on it. Any advice on how to, how to proceed there? Ask the question right now. Probably not appropriate here. Then I um, would say we could just pull it off the agenda, off. but we will have to do all all of the reading separately. Okay. Um, you know, I'll leave it. I'll ask it in a, in my council inquiries, and if we need to, um, then I can follow up. So I'll I'll leave it off. I don't want to go through the process of going through that four times. So should be okay. Thanks. You'll leave Sorry. it on. So okay. I will move okay. that council consent to approve the following agenda items uh, without debate. Uh, as you see on the screen. Thank you. Discussion on the motion, Council. Seeing none, I'll call for the vote on the consent agenda as presented. That motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Council. Now, we are now at item number four on our agenda, open forum. Administration, do we have any guests for open forum this evening, please? Ms. Winter? Thank you, Mayor. We do have one red, um open forum registration, Mr. Yatskoff, um, if you would like to make your way to the front desk there for your presentation. <clears throat> Welcome to council. Please have a seat. Uh, Hi, put the microphone close to your mouth. You don't mind speaking right in the microphone and state your name, please. And you have, you see the clock, you have five minutes when you begin your presentation. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I'm Ed Yatskoff, longtime town resident, and I'm here loosely kind of for our association of pickleball, not an official association of pickleball players, and uh, it's regarding the lighting on the tennis courts, of course. Now, the tennis courts are now shared with the newest and fastest growing sport, pickleball. Uh, they were erected in the mid-80s when there was only tennis there. Now, there's pickleball, and there's a lot more pickleball players. Uh, Pre-COVID, we had at least 80 player names on paper and many others that weren't tracked. Uh, what used to be only a senior sport has exploded and is attracting all ages now. Now, so far this winter, indoors, I've seen at least 25 to 35 new players. So every year it's growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, I think it's time for either dedicated pickleball courts or an expanded tennis courts with shared allowances for pickleball because uh, uh, the outdoor courts have seen exponential growth by both sports. Uh, last year, many players during the evenings grew tired of waiting to play and they had to leave due to darkness. And the weather was good. It was just the darkness that sent them home. Uh, court lights can support both sports and all ages. Uh, now pickleball has the longest span of, of any sport in town. It goes from April well into October you know, uh, if the weather's good after Thanksgiving. So that's like seven months long, uh, longer than any other sport. Uh, now mentioned in the council report of about the lighting. Now the professional sports lights, of course, appear to be quite elaborate and expensive, but the light poles also mentioned in there, similar to the light standards used in parking lots and installed at ice rings would be the best option of what has been put forward. Uh, I was kind of surprised that there's no mention of solar lights with storage batteries mentioned. Uh, the, the lights on these courts are really only needed for at most four hours a night during early spring or late fall. Now, the best option for any outdoor lighting, which everyone has chosen, of course, is motion detectors. Lights are the, uh, the drawback with timers 
is that the lights would go on even during rainy days when the courts aren't being used. So motion detectors now are used in many places like parking garages. In Germany, they're used on some streets. When the cars drive down the streets, they all go on or when you're walking and, uh, and in office buildings. Now, a, however, until a permanent light configuration is set up, the generator solar powered lights mentioned on this report, you know, would be greatly appreciated. Now, of course, you're going to get complaints about these lights. Uh, parents will complain they don't want their kids encouraged to hang out at the skateboard park at night. So you're going to get grief over that. Uh, now, all you have to do is just don't put lights on the skateboard court. Just keep them on the tennis side. They'll get a little bit of light, but uh, then they won't be hanging around there all night. Uh, and then motion detectors, eliminating <clears throat> the lights being on every night to appease the homeowners who are worried about the lights being on until 11 o'clock, 1130 at night. So if there's motion detectors on and nobody's there, the lights are going to stay off. And that also eliminates parks people from coming out and shutting them off or doing something like that. Uh, now, uh, speaking on behalf of pickleball players, our priorities are as follows. First, court lights, along with more pickleball lines drawn on the existing tennis courts. Uh, a lot of times tennis courts only have two players. Pickleball, you get two courts on one tennis court and pickleball is always played doubles. So you get eight people playing on one tennis court as opposed to two tennis court players. Uh, our second priority down the road, I guess, or maybe even now if there's enough money is to expand the existing courts by adding two or more dedicated to pickleball and in the same location, and then the windscreens that are up there already, and the fencing would be utilized. Uh, and three, of course, dedicated pickleball courts. So I ask council to look into expanding this growing sport as it will serve many ages and uh, not just children who have taken the bulk of a lot of sports facilities in our town in the past, playgrounds and, and hockey rinks and, and things like that. I think it's time to look at an adult sports for a change and more kids are going to be coming into pickleball as shown this winter showing up and, and we're kind of teaching them the game the people there uh now the outdoor hockey rink lights uh, on the one that were mentioned in the report now there's also a mention here about impact on nearby homes now i wonder when those new outdoor hockey rink lights were put on did they impact the nearby homes all winter from being on or do they go off at night or do they stay on all night? I don't know. Okay. And, you are, you are uh, past, sir, you are past time. Pardon? You are past your five minutes. Okay, good enough. Anyhow, do you have one uh, quick last comment to make. Go ahead. One quick last comment. Uh, indoor has drawbacks. The closeness of the courts, the temperature in the gym is not controlled. It's very warm and there's poor ventilation. Anyhow, thank you. And I hope we get some lights on there for everybody in this town. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Any questions from council? Sir, if you care to sit down just for a moment, we have a couple of oh, quick questions for okay. you. The interrogation shall begin. It shall begin. It goes both ways, you know. <laughs> it, it goes both yeah. ways. Yeah. Councilor Tessa, you have the floor, Renee. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I do like pickleball. As a firefighter in the fire halls, we have all the painted lines and all those type of things. So question for yourself, would a pickleball court suffice in the outdoor rinks in the off season? The surface is too slippery. The concrete too smooth, too slippery. So if there was sport turf put in there or that rubber piece? Well, you could only get two courts in there too. You're well better off putting box. And then you'd also need an equipment box there. Well, lots of rinks and just set up so there's more expense. Whereas if we share the tennis courts, the windscreen's already there, the fence is already there, and all the equipment's there for us. So yeah, you know, so some people were set up their own for a while. I think that was two years ago during COVID, and they said it was just too slippery. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks for the feedback. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councillor Miller. Ashley, you have the floor. Thank you. Thanks for coming with that presentation um, or of your needs for pickleball. Um, how do you feel about the current location right now? Did you just speak up a little? Oh, sorry. How do you feel about the current location of the courts um, at the tennis court? Like, it, do you like that location? I'm just curious. Are yeah, you suggesting it's that it's a good you... location and okay. there's room there for expansion too? Okay. Towards 
uh, the soccer field that's there. There's a big space there where a path yeah. goes through. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious because I've heard some uh, people talk about relocating the tennis courts as well. So I just wanted to know how, your thoughts on that. So. Well, I wouldn't know why they would want to relocate the tennis courts. Uh, they're good courts. Mm -hmm. uh, the last people who surfaced that did a really good job. Yeah. And there's only a few little cracks in there now, as opposed in the mid 80s, uh, when they built those courts, they had to replace them in five years because the company, uh, I don't know what they did with the surface or that. So those courts have only been actually resurfaced since the mid eighties twice. Okay. Uh, so I don't know why you'd want to tear them up. And what would you put there anyhow? I don't know. Well, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I won't get into that conversation. I just was the, the basis of what you're saying is you'd like to expand that location specifically. Yeah, no location's okay. fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's thank it. you. One last question. Councilman Newkirk, Steve, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you for coming in and presenting. Um, while they were asking questions, it gave me a quick moment to pop open the, our Places and Play Recreation Master Plan. And uh, I'll be interested to see um, how the timing on that plan works into future capital asks and the planning administration is going to do. Uh, when I do look on there, it, uh, there is a, an allocation of funds that was projected in that document to, you know, to support the expansion of pickleball in Beaumont. So mm -hmm. um, I just can't quite remember the the date that this plan was put together, but it you know at that time so it was 2019. In here, it projected in 2021 we do that. Um, so you know so there's um, some commitment from that rec master plan to uh, you know to pickleball as well. So I'll be interested to see how that comes to life in future budgets here. So sure, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, just one question towards us now because it's on the agenda here. Does that mean it's gonna? It, there's money for the lights, or is just looking into it? Or the report will be used as information for future for okay. the council at a, at a future budget discussion. Okay, um, as possibility. But um, I do appreciate Councillor Tessie's suggestion of the existing surfaces that's already there. We resurface it versus expanding the tennis court. You have to do all, all the groundwork, all the drainage work. It's a lot of work to expand a tennis court uh, versus maybe resurfacing something. But something to discuss for the future. But great suggestion. Uh, see no further uh, council questions, sir. Thank you for presentation. Pickleball is a growing sport in Beaumont. They really oh, is. Yeah, it's huge. And it's yeah. it's on our radar as a council to make sure we look after yeah, good. adult recreation, not just youth recreation. So uh, it's on our radar. I do appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Good. Wonderful. Thank, thank you all. You. Have a nice evening. Next item on the agenda is six um, A business items. A Arts Center Steering Committee. Presentation from uh, Mr. Savard. Mr. Tolley, gentlemen, would you please uh, join us at the podium, at the table there with the speaker? And please ensure when you speak, the microphone is in front of your face. You to move back and forth so people at home can hear you and people inside here can hear you as well. Gentlemen, you have, uh, I believe we have 10 minutes for the presentation ish. A little more than that if we need it. Okay. So when you're, oh, Mr. Souter, sorry, you'll be speaking first. Mr. Souter, you have the floor, Paul. Oh, hang on. I hit your button there. There you go. No, don't, don't, don't touch it. <laughs> I'm in control of the mics once in my life. Don't touch the button. This is what happens when I come back in person, your worship. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. We're here this evening with a few members of the committee uh, to present a PowerPoint to you with an update on the committee's work and the status of, uh, of the work that we've been working on since April of last year. And this report is for council to receive in, as information. So we've got the committee chair, Mr. Carl Savard, and Mr. Grant Tolley with us this evening, and they're going to run through the PowerPoint for you. Thank you. Gentlemen, I, please proceed at your, at your leisure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I uh, appreciate the time that we have to, to come before this council and update the council on the work that we've been doing as a committee. Um, our committee uh, has been highlighted We've, we've been meeting for several months now and, and uh, we're a committee uh, based of volunteers with a term of reference that was provided to us by, by council, the, the previous council. And we've been uh, working faithfully and, and diligently to come up with the answers that the terms of reference has asked us to, uh, to, to bring forward. And some of these uh, terms of reference answers include uh, recommendations to council related to the best site possible for one of these uh, art centers, uh, the size and amenities, as well as 
uh, suggestions related to the operating model and the funding sources. Our, uh, our committee consists of seven individuals plus three members of the of city uh, administration. Uh, I have been uh, I've been asked to chair and uh, I, I find it a privilege to do to do that. The members consist of many professionals, uh, both active professionals and retired professionals that vary uh, in, in their skills from engineering to project management, to medical and to arts and financing. Uh, for instance, I have a background in construction engineering. Um, Ms. Mr. Tolley has a background in uh, project management related to community and arts and culture developments. Uh, Chantel Fortin has a background in arts as well. And Ms. Willis has a background as in pharmacology and she has a, a, a real desire uh, and a real love for art. Um, we also have, my apologies. We also have uh, Dr. Gates on our uh, committee and she's been involved in arts for over 30 years, 35 years. And she's very knowledgeable and she has been a, a, a great influence on, uh, on the committee and the work. Mr. Hoare is, uh, has a background in financing, uh, which will come in handy once we uh, look at the uh, uh, options related to financing. And Ms. McLean has, uh, has a background in professional theater as well. So we have a very background of individuals and uh, uh, throughout these individuals is meshed a strong love for arts of any kind. And that is one of the reasons why this committee is brought together and these individuals have volunteered to, to see something um, such as an art center come to fruition, hopefully, uh, and, and see that dream of, of presenting to the community an art center where they can come together and enjoy the arts in, their, in its variety of forms. I'll pass the time over to, to Mr. Tolley and he'll, he'll uh, discuss a little bit of the background, what we've uh, been doing a little bit and the next step moving forward. Your Worship and uh, Honorable Councillors, uh, glad to be here tonight and to uh, bring you up to, up to date on this project that has been around for um, for me at least three councils now. This is the third one that we've worked with and uh, glad to uh, to be able to present here and uh, and to show you that some real progress is being made and, and to uh, share our enthusiasm to have this come uh, as um, Chair Savard said, uh, come to fruition here in the, in the near future. Um, how did we get here? Uh, we've been at this, as I mentioned, for uh, uh, a number of years, uh, council and the community uh, discussing the, the needs for an art center and, um, and how, can we, uh, how can we pull this together. Uh, the art center project got a real boost with the, uh, as the first bullet here mentions in the 2020 Recreation Parks and Facilities Master Plan. It recommended uh, feasibility studies and conceptual designs, location analysis, uh, and bouncing off of that, um, council discussed it, and funds were approved in uh, 2020 um, for a feasibility study, which was done and uh, by our, I always get this backwards, RWDI. Um, we're engaged to undertake a feasibility study and it's on file and it was uh, very good and gave us a really good foundation uh, off of which to, to jump um, and uh, give us some, some uh, direction as well as some velocity there. Um, June 16th of 2020, a draft report was presented and council then um, directed that this should, be, uh, should go forward. Um, and uh, sorry, I think I missed it. It was April 27th, so a year ago, uh, the date's not there, a year ago tomorrow that uh, this committee was formed. 
um, my motion of council. And uh, we met first in July. Uh, we spent a fair bit of time looking at the terms of reference. We had a good outline of what council expected, and then we added to it um, to create terms of reference, which were subsequently uh, approved so that we had some focus to what we were doing because this is a very complex um, project, a lot of things to look at, multidimensional, and, uh, uh, and a lot of background research that needed to happen. So that came together. We met approximately every three weeks, uh, more or less. Um, and our first, uh, our first focus was to look at um, a site and do research on where could this arts center go? As any businessman, businesswoman will tell you, um, success of a business is uh, often based on location, location, location. And so this became the first thing talking about where do we put it so that it serves the needs of as many people in the community and as many factors in the community, factions um, as, as possible. Um, so we uh, actually, we, with the cooperation of the uh, Seniors Association, we piled the whole committee on, um, on their bus a couple of Saturdays and we had selected 10, was it 10 or 11 sites, possible sites, and we actually went and walked the land. Um, I'm a farm boy and that was always what my father taught me is you walk the land to make sure it's, uh, um, it's going to serve your needs and be successful. Um, and then I believe it was actually our chair, uh, Mr. Savard, who, um, when we start walking the sites and everybody says, oh, this one's nice for this reason and that reason and the other reason. Uh, and those comments are all really subjective, personally subjective. One person likes this site, one person likes that site. So uh, um, Chair Savard came up uh, with a uh, list of criteria by which we scored all 10 or 11 of those sites uh, to give it at least a modicum of scientific rigor so that we were comparing apples to apples amongst the various sites. Um, we, uh, that process went on for some months uh, as we worked through that and scored the various sites and we have narrowed it down to four sites that scored within a point or two of each other. And, um, and then we realized as part of that, that we could, not, um, we could not proceed any further without getting the viewpoint of um, an architect or engineers, uh, building engineers, structural engineers, to look at those four sites and say, okay, what are the, what are the hidden, uh, uh, what I call the hidden bummer factors? What's, uh, what's going to jump out at us that we don't know about and we haven't been able to assess? And that's pretty much where we're at now, working with an architectural consultant who is also looking at a conceptual design. Um, along with that, uh, we piled in the bus a, a, a couple more uh, Saturdays and we toured um, a number of existing theaters, theaters that have already been built, some old, some, uh, some new, actually we visited the two newest um, theaters, art centers that had been built in the city of Edmonton. Uh, you may know the Roxy Theater, which is just now, I think, uh, coming into, back into production. And uh, the new Varscona Theater, which has been up and running in a couple of locations. And then we uh, toured some others to get a, a taste of uh, several things, to look at what worked well with these new constructions and what didn't. And uh, the people at those theaters were very candid in saying, if I had to do it again, I would not do this and I would do this. Uh, so we have uh, looked at all of those kinds of things um, and then put that, uh, that information together um, with uh, looking at the, the arts center as a whole, we started to look at size. How big do we want this to be? What, uh, what are the needs there uh, that uh, it should meet? So it's, a, as I mentioned, a, excuse me, a multidimensional kind of thing where you try to find a balance between size, uh, what is going to happen in the building functions 
and then the forms, uh, and then the, the site location, because the, the site will, to some extent, uh, dictate uh, form and function. Um, and then we moved on to, uh, uh, and actually we're at the, maybe I can go to this one. Um, there's where I saw the date uh, a year ago. Uh, currently, we're uh, looking at an independent architectural site review. Um, our architectural consultant is coming back to us with those assessments from their point of view, the architects and the engineers saying, well, this site's going to work better because of that site may not be as good. So the weighting that the committee gave it may vary. And we're just at that uh, point of, of looking at that and, and rescoring, I guess, or reassessing it. Um, we're also looking down the road at some uh, operating models for this is going to be a major facility and I, I dare say a, a flagship facility for the city of Beaumont. Um, how do we want it to run uh, and what recommendations can we come up with there and we have gathered a lot of information from those other theaters that we have uh, visited and uh, done some online research to, to look at uh, operating models. Funding sources, we're looking at, uh, I mean, the big question is uh, how, how are we going to pay for this? So we want to come back to council with some solid recommendations of here is where uh, we are certainly prepared to uh, assist in funding this. We, uh, we're sure that there is funding beyond municipal funding that can be brought to bear on this project. Um, and then of course, determining the, uh, the pr preferable site location that will be a, a uh, comeback in the recommendation. So on the first bullet across there, Q3 of, the, of this year, uh, over the, the next uh, two or three months, we'll be finalizing work and assuring alignment uh, with other City of Beaumont plans and priorities. We, uh, we recognize that we're not in a silo, that uh, everything else is gonna take a back seat so that uh, this arts center can be, can be built and built now. We recognize that you as council uh, and administration have quite a, a chore to make this all fit together so that everyone, if possible, can, uh, um, can have, uh, have uh, can be happy with the, the recommendation that comes forward and, and uh, we don't have any uh, big winners and big losers. We would like to see a win-win-win type of situation. Uh, so we're looking then at uh, the first quarter of this year. So beginning in September, I know it's when you people go into uh, uh, into your budget deliberations and start to prepare budgets, uh, capital budgets for the uh, uh, near and midterm. And uh, we uh, are quite confident we'll have, uh, have some solid recommendations for you to consider in those deliberations this fall. Um, next steps, uh, I think I've covered most of this. We're looking at, uh, at site options and rankings, uh, the venue, size and amenities, and by amenities, we need things like parking, traffic patterns, all of those kinds of things, operating models, and then the funding opportunities that I've, uh, I've spoken a little bit about. So that's pretty much our, uh, our presentation to bring you up to date on uh, where we, uh, where we are, uh, are at and where we're headed. And we look forward to coming back to see you again, probably in the uh, late summer or early fall to, uh, to bring you our recommendations for your consideration in your, in your fall uh, sittings. Thank you. If I, if I could just add two quick points. Yes, go ahead. The, the committee is very much aware that the decision that, that, that we make or the recommendations that we make are for long-term. It's beyond our lifetime, most likely. It's a 75 year plus or 50 year plus project if it comes to fruition. So we are very careful to make sure that, we've, that we get it right the first time. And the second, uh, the, the second point is that, is that the committee, as we are reviewing these items, we are also keeping an open mind that, that as we study this, as we come together with, with all of this information coming in, that our recommendations may look a little different than we originally had anticipated. 
but we are keeping our an open mind and receiving all the information and and just assessing it as it comes. Great, thank you, thank gentlemen. You. Thank you. Uh, I'll open up to questions from council and see Councilman Gough Swain. Uh, Sam, you have the floor, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thanks for coming <clears> in. Um, first off, you know, congratulations on on an incredibly strong committee. Um, you know, when 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 the motion was made. You know, the concern sometimes is, you know, in politics, you know, good ideas go to die in a committee. And I was worried about that. Um, and, and I really just um, just want to say thank you for all the hard work that you guys have got, uh, that you guys have all done to get here. Um, an incredible amount of work. And and obviously you talked about the backgrounds of everyone who's on there and, and uh, just passion is one thing, but the experience um, comes through. And, and, and that's why I'm really, really excited uh, that this committee is, is moving forward at such speed. And, um, you know, from all accounts that, that people are really enjoying the, the process. So um, congratulations on, on chairing such a, a strong committee. Um, I, I'm going to be pretty direct here and, and uh, recognizing where you are in, in your timelines. Um, but I, I just want to provide a, a realistic perspective from from my from my seat on this side when you so you, you head up there we we went through this discussion and you talked about there's a third time going around a council coming back and all that sort of thing and we had the when that presentation came to the previous council and it had a whole bunch of options and and it had you know large dollar capital items attached to it um i think it was fair to say that um you know that that scared council um the, those large numbers um and ultimately that that came in in June and, and then really nothing happened with it. Um, you know, we accepted it for information and, and then ultimately, um, you know, as I was thinking through that, going back, it's like, okay, well, we accept it as information and nothing's really happening. So we, we actually need something more. And, and that's where the committee idea came from was to actually have, ha have some local folks with experience go through and, and, and provide us um, a real detailed analyzed approach of how we can do this. Um, I think everyone on council, the previous council anyway, was certainly very interested in, and, and knows the need for a space like this. Um, but the concern um, was we saw a price tag uh, and, and I think that, that scared a few folks off. So um, my, my comments here and, and some questions are gonna be around, you know, making sure that we don't go too far down the line um, before and, and before we kind of, getting testing the temperature with council. And there may be questions you aren't able to answer today. Uh, and, and that's fair. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna talk about the, the two key things. Obviously you talk about location and you talked about the cost. So on, on the location PC, you talked about narrowing it down to four sites. You're having architects come in and take a look at it. Um, I, I wanted to acknowledge that you, you spoke about the other priorities that are going on. And, and you know I think you're aware that we are doing a kind of an asset inventory across the city and looking at all of our assets and where all of our buildings are. And it's not just, um, we're not just focused in on, uh, on an art center. So I appreciate that. I mean, there's this place, there's the library, there's all, all sorts of things that, that are looking for this. So I'm glad that that's being considered. Um, my, my concern or my worry is that, um, you know, if we're waiting until really Q3, Q4 before this comes back in front of us, um, yeah, my worry is that you guys do all this hard work without really checking in with council in terms of location I'll speak to now. Um, and for whatever reason, it doesn't, um, you know, you haven't got the feedback from council. Um, my worry is that we're, you guys might be too far down um, and, and some of the, the good work. So I'm just curious around, um, you know, why there wasn't, uh, why there hasn't been a discussion with council on, and these are the kind of the areas that we're looking at. This is how it scored them. Um, and, and just to, to kind of test the temperature on location initially um, before getting too far. So I'll, I'll ask that question first and then I'll dive into costs. So did you guys give consideration to check in with council um, before moving too much further down these four sites? We can certainly do that if that's, uh, if that's your, your wish. Um, if I may just speak to the location issue, um, of the four locations that I mentioned, three of them are currently owned by the city. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've looked at them uh, from all perspectives and any of those three uh, would work perfectly well. It's just a matter of this is better in one site or that is better in the other site. 
The forest location is privately owned, which immediately has the implication that if that were the recommended or chosen site, then we're upping the budget and by probably several million yep. dollars uh, to acquire that land. So that's a, a major consideration. Um, I would think that we could certainly come back to council sooner, uh, maybe in the next uh, month or two, uh, we'd have to, to see if we're prepared, to, if the committee's prepared to do that, to make a recommendation on, on location. Um, but uh, our hesitation is that we are awaiting, yeah. uh, you referred to the, the asset uh, study that's going on, and we're waiting to hear what that is going to tell us because that may well affect the, the location that, For sure. that we choose. Um, and perhaps I can, um, this may add some clarification to it. When the committee started a year ago, we all went into the, uh, our discussions thinking, oh, standalone art center, you know, this nice, big, beautiful building that's going to be this flagship and standalone. But just within the last few months, um, after we had toured the, uh, the various facilities around the region, uh, we woke up and said, well, there's a number of theaters slash art centers out there that are not standalone, that are in a multi-use, uh, we often use the term multiplex sure. building, and we haven't looked at that. And so we are now uh, looking at that to see if that's something that could work here in Beaumont. And we're not far enough down that road to make any recommendations, but I think the general consensus is that it's certainly an option on the table that, uh, uh, that could fit well with the asset uh, allocation study uh, once we get that information from the consultants. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and, and I chose my wording, I hope I tried to choose my wording carefully around the, the temperature check. I, um, you know, we, you, we, you guys are established for a reason to go and, and do the work and come back to council. Uh, and, and certainly nothing worse than, than having council in the middle of it as you go through and, and jumping ahead of steps. But um, yeah, there, there are there are multiple things that are moving right now across the city mm -hmm. that, you know, our, our job is, you know, to look at the bigger picture. Right. And, and so I, I think there would be value in, in a temperature check and I'll, I'll leave it up to my other councillors to, to kind of weigh in on that just around the location, just to, again, not, not for us up here to make any votes or anything like that, but just to hear the feedback. What, what are we thinking? When, when, you know, we've obviously got our own kind of thought process in, in our mind. You know, we have an arts district for a reason, all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and so just, just trying to get an understanding around that before that goes too far. So that I'll, I'll leave that there um, uh, fr from, from my side and, and see if, um, if other councils were looking, uh, are interested in, in kind of getting a bit more um, before we get too far down and here's the recommendation mm -hmm. and or where, where did that come from, right? So yeah, um, the second question, if you don't mind. Please proceed. So the next one, uh, just around the cost piece, and, and let me just state you know, that there's a reason why I made the motion in the first place, and it's because I want to get this done. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, much, much needed for our community. Um, you know, we, we've heard multiple um, reports back from all different sectors across our, off our, across our city here around the value of this. Um, what I want to avoid, though, is, is that, that sticker shock um, that, that came last time. Um, and so recognizing that, you know, I'm not asking you to, to throw out a number of what these sites are gonna cost today. Um, but I, I, I am curious if, if, uh, if the committee has thought through that um, and, and what your thought process, when you look at selection criteria, you narrow the four sites down, you talked about, you know, private location adding millions. Um, I'm just curious if, if you guys have, uh, how, how much of, you know, is this going to be is this going to be amenable to council given the, the financial challenges that every municipality has i'm just curious if um how much that goes into into your kind of thought process as you look to put a recommendation uh, in front of council well um if i can respond there's two or three elements to your question about cost um and i have always hesitated when people say how much is this going to cost uh I have never wanted to throw out a definite number because then it becomes carved in stone and we come back and it's 
you know, five million dollars. That's why I didn't ask you. you said, yeah, no, so I didn't ask you a number. So, I want uh, I want to know what is your thought process. How, how have yeah. you considered what this might look like in front of council, given the the constraints and and the debt we, and all that sort of stuff? We have definitely a and. Uh, uh, and actually, in our deliberations for every aspect of this center, uh, cost and trying to restrain the costs, not just of the building itself, but of the, the furnishings and the amenities inside and outside the bill, uh, building. We've uh, we spent several several meetings going through the list of what do we want and what do we not want, and a number of items were uh, dismissed. So we have been very aware that uh, this is going to be a major expenditure for the city of Beaumont. And as taxpayers, we're very aware of mm -hmm. that. Um, but the other side of that coin is that this is a very complex building serving a number of complex functions, and it's going to cost. Uh, the sticker shock will be, uh, will be high, I'm sure. And the last item I'd like to say, and then I'll turn it to Carl, is uh, um, the uh, we are not really good. We're none of us on the committee is uh, uh, is trained in quantity survey or or a cost estimation for this kind of thing. And this is why we are looking now to the architects and the engineers who will have a much better handle on saying. Once we get the size more or less nailed down and the location and, and uh, take in all of those variables, they will be in a better position to give us at least a, a fairly um, fairly small cost range, which then of course we will bring back to you. But I would like to add a proviso there that uh, the sticker shock, uh, we have spent some time we um, discussing the costs and that uh, we certainly don't expect that the municipality, the city of Beaumont is going to foot the entire bill. There are programs out there on a, on a provincial level, on a federal level, and even possibly some international funds that we would look hard and we're offering to help uh, to find some major funding to reduce the cost to the, to the city of Beaumont. Yeah. I Appreciate that. And just before you, you jump yeah, in there, Carl. I, I just wanted to, to add that uh, we, we understand the complexity of the project, but, uh, and we we were hoping to bring a few more answers, but there's too many variables out there still, and we're not quite there. But I can assure the council and the mayor that as we have answers for these things, that we will uh, go through Paul in, consul in consultation with city staff that we have on committee will make sure that we approach council and provide these answers and as best we can so that yes one you don't have that shock and awe and you have all of the answers that you need in order to make your decision yeah i appreciate it and, and i guess my last comment on it your worship if you don't mind um I think it's, it's one thing that the sticker shock is there um, and, and recognize it's going to come and, and, you know, hopefully there's a chance to socialize that through, uh, you know, I think most folks um, that I've spoken to anyway, and it was clear in the our places in play master plan that then the need for something like this, um, I think most folks can, can get on board with this. What I always hear though is, you know, make sure you do it right. Don't, don't mm -hmm. cut the corners. Um, and we've seen some locations that have done that and, and the challenges that have come with us. So if you're going to spend the money, do it right. Um, and, and so I, I'll just leave that with you. Um, I'm not, you know, issuing an open checkbook here, but I, I just want to make sure that that um, that is where my head is at. If we're going to do this, let, let's do it properly. Um, we anticipate that there will be some public consultation in the future oh, yeah. in regards to this project if it goes ahead. <clears throat> so we're quite mindful about all of the all of the different things that can mm -hmm. that come around this public consultation as well. So we're we'll try to get this council all of the answers that we can that we can get so that when it comes time to bring the project to the public, that you have everything in front of you that you need. Appreciate that. And and you talked about um, looking at excuse the pun, looking at grants and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, I don't think there's a better person in Canada probably to, to help um, uh, with that than Mr. Tolly here. So you guys are in great shape and, and thank you. I'll, uh, 
Molly Gillip. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Appreciate that. Um, I know this is more of a progress update report. Um, questions are good questions, but we have to sort of avoid getting into a bit of a debate and expressing our opinions and so on. I know it's hard not to. I mean, it's really hard not to, but we need to try and keep it as a progress update. So, Councillor Sheen, try and keep your questions pointed as best you can, and we'll proceed with Councillor Barnard, followed by Councillor Tessier. Kathy, you have thank, the floor. Thank you very much, Mayor. Well, I want as much time as he had. So. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll just we'll move along. I don't have as many good questions. He asked he asked a lot of the questions, and thank you very much. I I I often don't hear how good a committee is doing, but I've heard nothing but positives from the people that I know in the community and the arts in, in the arts community in particular, saying that they feel really well served by what your committee is doing. So. You know, we don't usually hear the good stuff. Sometimes we hear only the bad stuff. But I just want to say, to echo what Councillor Bunkoff Swain said as well, that hearing really good things about the process, the thoughtfulness, the touring, all of that stuff, really, really good. Um, I have the same queries or concerns, worries, as Councillor Bunkoff Swain mm -hmm. around location and, and, and socializing it to council and letting, letting us learn what you've learned. Because I, I have a fear that I'm going to see this at budget time with a binder this big of all kinds of things and, and what I need to spend time on, I won't have time to spend time understanding. So if you can please avoid that happening, I really would appreciate it because we need to get our heads around this because we are gonna be the ones that have to defend the decision one way or the other. So um, I, I, I do wanna say we need time to understand what you know. You've taken a year already and I, I, I don't begrudge you that time. I'm sure you needed it we won't have a year. <laughs> and and I, when I heard there were four locations, all I want to know is where are they? Where are they? Like, tell us where they are. Um, and I under appreciate you don't want to politicize it too quickly and get people lined up on one or the other. So while I get it, I, I really do think leaving it to the end of the third quarter might be too late. And I just don't know. It. Either that, or maybe you're not expecting so much from us at budget time, maybe, and this is my question. I am getting to a question there. Um, from projects that I've been involved in, if you can get council or, or the authority to make a decision of a yes, even if it's a small yes in the right direction, that's better than getting a hard no, because then it just kiboshes the whole project. So what, what are you going to be expecting from council in, in September, October, like surely we can't make a decision on the whole budget until we see all of the budget for all of the projects that we're involved in. So what are you gonna be coming back? Essentially, this is what we, we want to study further. Like what, what is the, your next step there? Well, I think our hope would be to bring a recommendation that uh, saves you having to examine the pros and cons of four locations we want to make that decision and bring you the one that we recommend saying uh, to, to steal Paul Suter's uh, um, metaphor he says here's the car that you're going to drive and here's where it's being driven uh, we want to come back with some firm and solid recommendations on location size and cost range for you then to make a decision uh, now we can't we, the committee, can't really flesh that out too far yeah. until we have all of this other information on the, uh, the, the near and midterm capital budget of the city of Beaumont for your other, your other capital needs. Uh, and that, I think, is, is uh, where, uh, where council's big, what council's big job will be is to mesh that all together when you have the other capital need requirements in, uh, in this project. Uh, and we would like to have enough solid information in front of you so that you can make that work somehow. And you mentioned public consultation. So again, I can't see us making a decision on budget at budget time without having more opportunity to hear where we're going and mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's a tough timeline if, if you leave it that late. That, I guess that's all I, I can say at this point. I'm a little concerned about that, but I would still encourage you to, obviously you're going to keep going, but to maybe take it as, maybe it's one step at a time. Maybe there's another way to, to, to look at that. And Mr. Savard, and then I'll start. I, I, I just wanted to say- <laughs> I'm probably getting in the weeds. So. Mr. Souter has been very good with this committee in keeping us on track and, and keeping us mindful of, 
of the timeline that he anticipates as well. So uh, I think this discussion with council tonight and Mr. Suter being here uh, will help him as well so that we can bring all of this information to you when you need it. That, that was my other concern and I think you've answered it. The administration's working closely with you so they, they do know the big picture and so they're, they're helping you to put it together in the right timeline. So I appreciate that. Thank you again for all you're doing. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Tesse, followed by Councillor McCook, followed by Councillor Miller. So, Renee, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, most of my questions and comments were gathered and answered from the other two councillors. But uh, again, I wanted to see locations and, and cost, obviously, because um, the more information, the better. And for us to understand it earlier is also better. Just a comment for next time it would be a 100% a good idea to get a temperature check on council and cost, right? If I'm going to build a house, I have a budget, and then you can, you know, kind of play with that. But if the numbers are so far out of reach where, where that temperature check does not go well, don't want to waste our time doing all that extra work with architectures until we kind of get that feeling. So just a comment for next time is all. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll try very hard as a committee to uh, gather the temperature of the council before we come back. Perfect, and thanks so much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor McCook, you have the floor. Go ahead, Kat. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you guys for coming in, um, especially as a new councillor. I appreciate being able to see the timeline of how everything came together, how the communities come together, and where you guys have found yourselves. So thank you for that kind of background as well. Um, my question has to do a little bit more with the, the sites and I guess you can tell council is kind of all on the same page in regards to understanding where you guys are at. Um, I know we have the kind of infrastructure inventory coming up as everybody has spoken to. Have you also explored options? Um, you know, there's, the talk of that we have to build a new high school and stuff like that. Have you considered the option of what connecting an arts facility to a new high school would be? We have had some discussion as a committee in regards to that. Yes, the original, uh, the first um, feasibility study mm -hmm. that was done by RWDI, mm -hmm. those four letters, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> examine that very closely okay. because that uh, that has been done a lot in a lot of mm -hmm. places attaching a, a theater to yeah. a school and the recommendation in that feasibility study and it was a very strong one said don't do it there have been a lot of horror stories quite literally uh, where um, municipalities have done that and tried to make it work and it it's just not a good combination uh, on the other side of that coin, he did recommend uh, saying that theaters, uh, arts centers work very well married to a, a library mm -hmm. and, and other types of facilities like that. Mm -hmm. And we have looked at that and we've talked to the library, uh, the folks at the library here, and we know they're looking for no more space, new space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we would be, uh, I'm sure we would be more than happy to collaborate with them to see if that could okay. be a, a marriage that could be arranged. Um, and everybody, as I mentioned earlier, it becomes a win-win situation if the dollars work out. That's always the big question. Um, so yes, we, we have uh, deliberated those things and looked at them and, and looked at what works well and what doesn't. Okay, so um, the possibility of, of collaborating with the library and stuff like that, that's still something that's being considered or? Still on the yeah. table. Yeah, we're, we're wide open on the considerations. Uh, to make it work because our goal is is to to make this project a reality and to make it successful mm -hmm. so with that in mind we're we're doing everything that we can to to get to that end goal perfect thank you and i guess um just just something quick have you encountered any challenges or obstacles that have held up any of your progress thus far uh, Not that we know of. Nothing no. insurmountable. No. Okay. I mean, there's always uh, bumps in the road, but yeah. we, we've gotten over yeah. them to this point. Okay. okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Kat. Appreciate that. Councillor Miller, Ashley, you have the floor, followed by Councillor Van Newkirk. Go ahead, Ashley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Catherine, uh, Councillor McCook's question just 
kind of brought one up for me quickly before I asked the one that I was going to ask. Um, when you talk about um, the arranged marriage with some with another group, when you're looking at these locations, are they involved in that as well? Or what's that discussion like? Well, they haven't been directly involved. We've had, you know, informal informal discussions saying, hey, you know, would you would you be willing to look at this with us? And actually that's probably a, a, a big reason that we haven't come tonight with a recommendation on locations, mm -hmm. on specifying one of the four, because if we do end up in a, in a marriage with another facility or organization, that's going to have mm -hmm. an impact on which site and location we choose. Right. So we're hoping to get over, get over those bumps in the road uh, in the next month or so as we get more information back from the, mm -hmm. the uh, capital assessment. Right. I can see how those pieces are trying to come together and all the moving parts um, yeah. and why you are where you are, you're at. Uh, the one question I had was when it, um, what has been discussed by the steering committee as options for financial assistance towards this project? And, and forgive me, I don't know exactly what was presented on the last council when this project initially was, uh, when it did come about, I'm sure there was some sort of, um, grants or, or something that was also brought forward. What are we looking at this time? Do you have any idea? In terms of amounts or uh, which? Uh, I, I don't know that you'll know specific amounts. Yeah. Um, well, the uh, maybe I can just mention the provincial government uh, has long had the CFET program, the Community Facility Enhancement Program, mm -hmm. which uh, made some positive changes just uh, two or three years back, which opened up the amount of funding, the, the top level of funding. So there is uh, substantial funds available right. through that program. Uh, and there's some other smaller programs okay. that are more directed to like energy conservation and, and those kinds of things. So mm -hmm. we may be able to access more than just the, uh, the facility enhancement program. On the federal side of things, uh, there is a program called the Canada Cultural Spaces Fund which the theaters that we visited in the city of Edmonton, they all access that program. Okay. And uh, there, is, uh, there is substantial funding available there in the, in the tens of millions, if that, okay. you know, up to in that range kind of thing. So if you take that into consideration and have hope that uh, mm -hmm. you know, we can access those, uh, that, brings the sticker shot down to where yes, we, we that's can what I was our going jaws to up mention. off the table and uh, yeah. say, okay, well, maybe we can make this work. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point. Just, you know, because we hear from the library, I know they're doing a lot of their own kind of fundraising, um, mm -hmm. going after those provincial grants. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think um, whether this becomes something that uh, becomes a dual project together or not, um, yeah, it's a definitely a good idea to do those those kinds of things so that the sticker shock is a little bit lessened. Um, but it sounds like it's on your radar. So thank you for that. Thank we're, you. we're also looking at uh, at different projects around the province that are at different stages, a little more advanced, and how they came up mm -hmm. with their their financing and seeing how we can um, come together with mm -hmm. with similar financing or. You know, finding out how they finance and how we can right. find opportunities to finance using the same scenarios. So we're looking outside as well. Wonderful. Sounds like you guys are on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Newkirk, Steve, you have the floor. Yeah, great conversation tonight. And thanks, guys. You're putting in your time. Uh, you're earning it here tonight. So thank you for that. Um, you know, we're talking about a, a, a new building, a new civic public building in Beaumont. And uh, it sounds like a co-facility option now is, is on your radar following, you know, the site tours that you've done. And I think that's great. And I think it's important that you guys made that connection. So um, if you hadn't, I, that's something I was going to bring up tonight. So I'm, I'm glad you're there already and you're looking at that. Um, the one comment that I haven't heard mentioned tonight in, in everything everyone has had to say is uh, specifically around exploring external partners and uh, partnerships on a facility. Uh, I don't know what that could look like but uh, or who the potential partners can be, but there could be a business case made for um, 
you know, if, if we build this facility, there's a so many year lease opportunity available to commit to X number of weekends per month or whatever there, you know, there are, there are groups out there that make a business of dinner theaters and there's ongoing concert circuit circuits and there's promoters that, that do these things. So uh, one of the considerations I don't know if you have done is, you know, what are the needs uh, so I think you understand well what the public needs are within Beaumont, but if, you know, how do we make sure that the facility that we build doesn't preclude the dinner theaters from coming, doesn't preclude a concert series, doesn't preclude a promoter bringing an event to Beaumont, um, you know, because those, those potential uh, revenue generators, um, you know, are, are going to be important to a facility like this. Could you guys maybe uh, talk about some of those considerations? We we have begun a, a, a quick discussion without much details yet on the operating model. This discussion will be coming up uh, in the next few meetings uh, as part of our committee. And this type of this type of question, this type of bringing in partners and so forth, we we consider it to be part of the operating model and how things. Uh, will best operate for this type of scenario, for this type of building. So we have we don't have even quite the answer to your question as of yet, but we have begun some discussion related to the operating model. If I can just mention quickly, uh, I, I hear what you're saying, Councillor Van Newkirk, and um, there are, corporations out there, large corporations that have uh, quite often backed facilities of this and actually been active participants and then been active users of the facility. And I'm thinking particularly of the Dow Center in Fort Saskatchewan. I don't know if any of you have been there and it's a yeah. fabulous facility and Dow Chemical pretty much footed the bill for uh, at least 50% of that. So maybe we need to go to Fort Saskatchewan and convince Dow Chemical to build a branch plant here and build half of our art center. <laughs> um, I'm kidding, of course, but uh, yes, I agree. It would be nice if we could find some corporate participation. Um, and the problem is that it needs to be pretty much a large, a large uh, corporation. Uh, to engage in the capital side of it. On the operational side of it, if we had, for example, the Mayfield Dinner Theater type of situation, um, that uh, uh, an operation of that nature uh, substantially changes the form of the facility. So we would need to be planning, uh, planning the, uh, the conceptual design around that kind of uh, end use. And not that we can't go back later and you know incorporate some kind of a dinner theater operation or something of that sort, but it's it's uh, it becomes very multi-layered to uh, to put that together. Yeah, maybe uh, just to build on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, maybe just through administration as well, and, and through Mr. Souter and your work on the committee, there has been sponsorship work done with a consultant and stuff. So maybe you guys, I don't know how current that would be given the COVID world we're in, but I would encourage you to, you know, dredge that up and, and think about that. But uh, just to just to back up a little bit too on the, um, you know, the model and the design, I, I do I do think that there are potential design considerations that you that you should think about as you as you narrow things down so that we're not precluding um, one group or another from from targeting Beaumont on its loop right you know I, you, we may not need a full service kitchen in the back but it would be you know probably great to have a half service kitchen and enough room to do something right if we don't do that then Beaumont doesn't get that stop maybe I, I don't know how that works or or if we don't have it um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm out of I'm out of examples, but I, I don't know what we need to consider. But um, you know, as you talk to you know promoters and and groups, and you think about the operating model, um, you know, I, I I just don't want to see us make a design leap and over to operations when we find that you know the needs of a circuit that could come to Beaumont and would be pretty cool in evening use. Um, you know, is precluded because we didn't consider something in the front end. And I know that can be a, a slippery slope and there's hindsight is 2020, all those cliches, right? But, you know, um, anyways, I'll stop there. I'm rambling a bit now, but I think you, I think you get what I'm going, where I'm going here, Grant. We do. And 
uh, and we have to some extent considered those kinds of things, but when you consider the full panoply of, of uses of the building, we have tried to design it, at least conceptually, is all that we've been up to at this point, so that we have uh, large, some large spaces that are multi-use and they can be adapted uh, to meet these needs of different things, uh, different users, user groups coming in. Um, for example, uh, we've called it an art center. We uh, were looking at art galleries for 2D and 3D uh, types of, uh, of art displays. And we would like that to be uh, available for the use of traveling exhibitions. You know, there's no reason we can't bring um, international quality exhibitions here to Beaumont. If, and you're absolutely right, if we have a space that can accommodate them uh, properly. Uh, so at the moment, we're looking at these multi-purpose, multi-use kinds of spaces, uh, and we haven't dropped them. Yeah, and then my concluding my concluding comment uh, will be um, around when I when I think to the town square and you know com conversations that you and I have had around the, you know the town square idea and I remember uh, vividly you know, you know you you letting me know make sure that we design something that's you know for season use right Let, you know, let's try and use it around the year round so you know I don't know what you uh, as a committee have considered for outside amenities um, you know I don't know that you can build it all at once. Right? You're focusing very much on a building or a co-facility, but if we if we don't have enough space to do something outside to make yes. a platform or use a wall or get some wiring in there, you know, I, I just need to. That, we need, I think we concept. need. Yeah, I think we need to make sure that yeah. the facility is not just something you walk into, but it's something that uh, can be used externally as well. So, um, okay. we have considered that, and it will be part of the, the conceptual design. Okay. Thank you, Mary. You've been very patient with us. No problem. This has been a good discussion, and I do appreciate. Uh, it's hard to ask questions while getting into the weeds. So it's, it's our nature. And my job is to pull us out of the weeds and keep us at a higher level. So uh, gentlemen, I do appreciate the presentation. I see no further questions from council. I do have a quick, of quick comments myself, if I may. Uh, many topics have been discovered this evening, so I won't go any, any rehash anything. One thing I do have a concern about is, is capacity. Now, let me see what I mean by that. We're looking at building recreational facilities, you know, soccer fields, ball diamonds, hockey rinks. We can go to the associations like amateur hockey, amateur football, amateur baseball, say, what's your registration? What are your projections? What do you need for space? How many practices, how many games and so on? Then you get some kind of an idea of the capacity we need for the future as we grow. Um, for, for example, what I'm getting at is if the McLab, for example, is say 300 seats, for example, they've had it for a number of years now, they're 34,000 people or 21. If the recommendation of the committee is to build a 400 seat uh, uh, theater in Beaumont, how are you going to make it worthwhile in terms of capacity. If, if McLab is 300 seats or 34,000 people only full half the time, if that's the case, why would we build something bigger? So when you come back with your recommendations, I'm assuming you're taking into uh, consideration capacity of how large to build and how often that theater will be utilized, how full will it be, will be only used on Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, or you anticipate all week long. So give us an idea of the background of the business case for the size of, of capacity that you're projecting for us in your recommendation. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah, and if I can just speak to that quickly. Um, the Beaumont Society for the Arts, some years ago when this process first started and, and the uh, uh, lobbying, I guess, for a, an arts center and a theater, quote unquote, uh, began, um, we held three public consultations over three different years um, within that, uh, within that framework and ask people, what do you want to see in, in the facility? And of course, the first question that comes up is how big, how many seats in the theater? How big are you gonna build the theater? Mm -hmm. And that went around and around and around. And uh, we ended up with a recommendation that a minimum of 350 seats, uh, preferably more, upwards 400 or more is what uh, I'm sure we'll come back to you as a recommendation. Because that capacity, you're absolutely right, Mr. Mayor, the, the capacity of the, the theater, the central facility there, uh, determines to large measure, how many parking stalls do you need to get all those people in yeah. those seats? Uh, how big does the lobby need to be? And then beyond that, we looked at, uh, I was talking about the multi-purpose 
rooms, uh, the rehearsal halls and, uh, you know, the foyers that can be used, uh, Galleria, if you like, that can be used for weddings and, and uh, you know, the sky's the limit for what can go in there. Uh, and that has to be considered. What, uh, what kinds of functions can we hold in here and size of those rooms um, and whether we need a kitchen or not and those mm -hmm. kinds of things that will all be part of it. Um, but then Good. that has implications down the road. So yes, we have considered that and uh, uh, the um, feasibility study, the RWDI study, um, the consultant agreed with us. He says Beaumont needs a, at least a 350 seat theater and space surrounding that theater to accommodate a, a crowd of that size for whatever functions come in. Okay, well, thank you. We look forward to your next appearance in Fort of Council. Thank you, I'm at the Council. Thank you for your presentation, gentlemen, and enjoy your evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next order of business is the auditor's report. Uh, before we begin, uh, Mr. DeBlanco, um, do you anticipate maybe needing 15 or 20 minutes? I'm only asking because we don't want to take a break at 7.30. I don't want to, I don't want to curtail the auditor's report. It's important to see me. If you need 15, 20 minutes, we should probably go now. If you need a half hour, we'll probably take a quick break now. What do you think you might need for time? Make sure we give you the opportunity you need to present to us. Uh, I might suggest we do the auditor's report now. And if we need additional time for the financial statement report presentation, we break before that one. Perfect. Ms. Winter? Mary, if I could have just a quick motion to accept this present, this last presentation as information. Right. Thank you. A little detail I should have thought about. Is there a motion from a member of council to report, to receive the report as information? Councilor Barnhart, you have the floor, Kathy. I move that the April 26, 2022 Arts Center Steering Committee report be received for information. Thank you, Councilor. Discussion on the motion? Council seeing none, I'll ask for the vote. And that carries unanimously. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Ms. Winter, for reminding me of what I should have thought about a moment ago. So having said that, I think we can proceed with the audit report. We're prepared to do that, are we? Thank you. Ms. McConnell, welcome back to Council. It's been a year. It has. It has we been a year. We're all not in little boxes anymore. Exactly. Either. So yes, we're back in, in person. We're glad you're back in front of us again, too. So please begin your presentation. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Councillors, it is a pleasure to be here in person and see you not in little boxes anymore. Um, again, it's our annual odyssey through the audit, so I will try and keep this brief and to the point because I know I'm probably the only one super excited about the audit report. So the first part of the audit report, really just um, we are at the point where we're kind of closing down and wrapping up our audit. We are essentially complete what we need to do pending council approval of the financial statements. Um, so we do have a few things that we always report to you, and those are required under auditing standards, and so I'll, I'll try and walk through those in our report at a very high level. So the first thing that I will note is there are a couple of things that we look at that are called significant risks in our audit, and those are areas where we think there's a higher um, risk of error or fraud occurring. And the first two that we look at that happen in every single audit um, are fraud risk related to revenue recognition and fraud risk related to management override. So we don't necessarily think there is fraud happening. It just is, those are the two areas that historically across um, all kind of financial reporting are the areas that are highest risk and have had the most frauds happen. So we do do additional work around those areas in particular. Um, in your revenue stream, we focus a lot on your sales and user charges because those are a little bit more complex and a little bit more unusual. Um, and other revenues as well. We have found no issues in our audit testing throughout those areas. Um, when we look at management override, we look at journal entries because that's an area where management could change the financial statements. We have nothing to report. We also take a look at the estimates and make sure we're comfortable with those. So the next part of our audit that we do spend some time on is around the estimates. Um, and that's just areas where there's some judgment and management um, might make some adjustments or judgments judgment calls about those numbers. And so we've listed off in our report just some of those numbers, but at a high level, we've reviewed all of the, the accruals and estimates that have been made in the financial statements and we're comfortable with what is in the financial statements. We have nothing to report there. We did not note any fraud or illegal acts throughout the course of our audit that we need to bring to your attention. 
Um, and the, your team did a fantastic and very clean job because I have a full page that essentially says we have nothing to report. So we have no adjustments. We have no what we call unadjusted items, which are um, variances that we might pick up and choose not to fix in the financial statements because they're not material. We have no disclosure items that we need to bring to your attention in the financial statements. From an internal control perspective, we look at your internal controls only from the perspective of looking at how it impacts the financial statements and the financial reporting. And so we would bring to your attention if we found anything that we thought was significant and would cause an issue in your financial reporting. I'm happy to report that we don't have any of those level of concerns. Um, we do have a couple of advisory comments that we'll carry forward to management, but nothing that we needed to bring to your attention. Um, in a report, we're just highlighting again, um, cybersecurity and a couple of vulnerabilities that have come forth in the last few months. We bring that to your attention only because it continues to be an area we see a significant amount of activity. Um, it continues to be an area of significant concern for many of many of the organizations we work with. And so just to bring that out um, and put it on your radar, we do ask some questions around cybersecurity, but it is an area that continues to evolve faster, I think, than anybody anticipated. From an independence perspective, we always confirm that we are independent. It's required by our auditing standards. We have nothing to bring to your attention that would impair our independence or that would cause us to need safeguards around our independence. From a technical perspective, there isn't a lot to highlight in terms of changes in accounting standards coming forward. There, there are a number of them, but they shouldn't have a significant impact on the city's financial statements going forward. We do have some changes coming to our auditing standards, which will impact the audit. Um, we will need to do a bit more work around risk assessment and risks. There's some new standards coming out there. And there is a new standard on quality control that is coming out as well um, that will require auditors to do a little bit more work around their internal control processes um, for product quality. Beyond that, I know our report includes a lot of information just around our approach, which is risk-based, which has not changed year over year. And then the rest includes our independent auditor's report, a draft of that, as well as a draft representation letter that we ask management to sign. We are issuing a clean audit opinion. We anticipate doing that as soon as council approves the financial statements. Um, and we also then will issue our audit opinion on the financial information return, the FIR, that needs to go in as well. So I am happy to answer any questions there are there might be about the audit. Um, any hard ones about the financial statements, save them for Curtis. Thank you very much for your presentation and the it sounds like a very good audit by the sounds of it. Uh, yes, that's very, very exciting true. and great work by Curtis in our financial department. This is your third audit now with us, Curtis, or second? Fourth, I believe. Yeah. Fourth already. Wow. Okay. <laughs> You're on cruise control. That's awesome. Councilman Cook, you have the you have the floor, Kat. Thank you. I just have a quick question regarding fraud. So, does the audit include any potential risks um, regarding fraud, both internal and external? So, we do consider fraud when we plan our audit, um, primarily from a financial reporting perspective. So, primarily making sure your financial statements don't include anything that would misstate the results. Um, from a material amount. Mm -hmm. So we do ask and inquire if there's been any instances of fraud that have been identified internally. Um, and sometimes that includes things like theft that, that are brought to our mm -hmm. attention. And then we adjust our audit procedures to address that. We didn't note anything this year and management didn't bring anything to our attention. It is definitely something we, we take into account. We always, auditors always hedge that a little bit with a, we can't guarantee we're going to find it. Mm -hmm primarily because the nature of fraud is usually that someone's trying to hide it. And so um, if there is a fraud and it does get hidden, we may not catch it, but we do consider it when we plan our audit and try and plan our procedures around that. Okay. And then during your audit, do you guys um, identify any areas of weakness or anything in financials that, that might leave us vulnerable to Fraud situations? So we didn't identify anything from an internal control perspective that we thought would lead to a material misstatement or we would have reported it. Um, and we didn't note anything that we would consider a significant weakness when we walked through those controls. I will caveat that with that we are looking at the numbers that are going to your financial statements primarily um, and that we wouldn't necessarily have seen every operational control that okay. you have in place. Okay. Um, so that's always a potential, especially as, um, especially as you get things like recreation programs and more cash-based things coming back to life again. Mm -hmm. um, those tend to be where we see more theft, more risk around that. Perfect. 
Thank you. And thanks to uh, Curtis and team for doing a great job. Thanks, Kat. Councilman Newkirk, Steve, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Um, continuing with um, a little bit towards that theme <clears throat> around uh, cybersecurity and vulnerability, I'm just wondering, um, there are comments in Appendix G around that. Um, and is that, um, do you do an evaluation of Beaumont's risk of being, you know, a victim of cybersecurity issues or what, is, what does that look like? Is there another cybersecurity audit we should be doing? Maybe I, I don't know enough about this stuff. So if you would, yeah. For sure. So we do include that more as information um, because we are seeing it so frequently among organizations um, and our IT people, our, our cybersecurity experts will basically tell most organizations it's not a matter of um, it's not a matter of if you will have cybersecurity, it's when. <laughs> um, and so you've probably heard a number of large, high profile um, cybersecurity ransomware attacks over the last probably five years. I think there are probably hundreds more smaller ones um, that are occurring with many organizations. So this is more generic. It is more meant to bring to your attention. Um, it is something that our cybersecurity team can and does do sort of what we call health checks on organizations. From an audit perspective, we ask at a very high level just to understand and if you have some processes in place, um, if you are thinking about cybersecurity, if there's any kind of material areas that we think you should look at, but we don't dig into all of the details of it. So it is something I think I bring to, I bring to um, council's attention really more from a governance perspective so that you can keep it on your radar. Um, I know I've sat on a number of organizations that have had to work through a cybersecurity yeah. incident, and it is worth thinking about in advance because unfortunately the need to respond in those incidents, it's, it's very quick. Um, so. Yeah, no, I hear you. That's good. Thank you. Um, second part um, on the audit, I know you're considering like, you know, the, the numbers in front of you, but increasingly um, council hears more about the forecasting and uh, the budget forecasts and, you know, the, the capital plan forecasts and, um, you know, one of the, one of the things that's been questioned a little bit more lately as, you know, council answers things like, um, you know, well, it's forecasted to be done in a couple of years. And, and then, you know, two years from now, the price has doubled from what the estimate was. And then residents are questioning the quality of the estimates in the forecast. Um, is, a, is a review of, like, is a review of forecasted numbers in scope for the audit that you do? Or what does that look like? No, it isn't. Um, and most auditors won't review forecasts. We do audit your budget numbers. Um, we understand the process around the budget because those are audited under in your financial statements. Um, sort of the more operational side, which is the forecasting and the process around that um, wouldn't be in scope for a financial statement audit, but definitely is something that I've known. I know our consulting team does work with a lot of organizations on assessing how they do that, what that process is. Um, so that would be something you could consider sort of as a separate look. Yeah, and the reason I bring that up is because you've sat here uh, patiently through the meeting and there's already been reference at least three times to, um, you know, forecasted costs and things happening down the road and thank you for the information we're going to have to budget that later right like and so yeah. that's why I kind of wanted to make that link between uh, in scope or out of scope for that forecasting so thanks for answering that. Absolutely. Thanks Councillor. I have one more question Councillor Barnhart. Kathy, you have the floor. And, and I will be very quick, I believe. Uh, in Appendix A, and it talks about the overview and approach, um, this is the second year that it's jumped out at me that it said role of town council. And I know that the second page was changed to City of Beaumont. And I'm just wondering, is that because this is a smaller audit than perhaps, you, and so it's kind of there's town councils and there's city councils and this particular format is town, or is there just a, an oversight? No, it's just a typo on my part. I caught it today as I was flipping. Oh, you saw it? Because <laughs> <laughs> so I, I wouldn't apologize. have said it, but it was the second time. Yes. Like, oh. Yes, and I caught it again, and I think it is, um, it's uh, It's just my lovely assistant helping me roll forward. I, I thought stuff. maybe we were just... No, nope. this is actually the same to presentation to I give to every organization. They, we all, um, of all sizes, so. Okay, um, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. So for the questions, thank you, Ms. Picotta, for your presentation. Appreciate that. We'll uh, see you next year, I guess. Terrific. Sounds good. Thank, thank you. you very much. And with that, Council, we will take a five-minute break. We'll come back, Mr. DeBlanco, for the financial statements, and then do a motion to accept the auditor's report and financial statements at the end of Mr. DeBlanco's presentation. So with that, we'll take five, and we'll see you.
All right, council and guests uh, in in house and at home, we are now back in session after a short break. We appreciate patience. We are still on business item six B, which is the auditor's report and the consolidated financial statements. So, Mr. DeBlanco, I'll give you the floor to continue the presentation, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening to the mayor and council. I'm Curtis DeBlanco. I'm the director of finance for the city. You've just heard from our auditors and the summary of their audit findings. Now before you is a report requesting approval of the financial statements, as well as some recommended transfers. I'll provide a summary of the financial highlights, as well as speak to the surplus transfers and transfers between reserve funds. We have five recommended motions here in the report. I won't read through them word for word. Um, they are to approve the financial statements, transfer the municipal operating sub surplus of 182,000 to the parks reserve, uh, the utility surplus of 608,000 to the utility reserve and uh, move some funds between the library's building reserve and their surplus account and the facility renewal reserve respectively. With that, I'll dive into some specific results uh, on the municipal operating budget, uh, which is we can see in the statements in the consolidated statement of operations, which is on page five, schedule six, which is on page 13 and note eight, which is page 22. The city did realize a shortfall of approximately 2.2 million on its municipal, uh, sorry, a revenue shortfall of approximately 2.2 million on its municipal operating budget. Shutdowns in the year of recreation facilities, childcare services uh, were key contributors to this and contributed to shortfalls on both sales, user charges, and rentals. These shortfalls were partially offset by a uh, municipal operating support transfer from the provincial government, which was approximately half a million dollars and, and it appears in the report as a government transfer dash operating. Administration was able to reduce expenses to offset uh, these shortfalls in the amount of $1.9 million. And at the completion of the year end audit, the 2021 municipal operating surplus is approximately $183,000. Next, on the utility operating budget, which um, you can see pieces of that on Schedule 6, as well as the surplus amount on Note 8, which is on page 22, the city generated a net surplus in its utility operations of 608000 This surplus is comprised of a surplus of 424, 127, and 57000 um, for water, wastewater, and solid waste, respectively. The main drivers of these surpluses are, of course, from increased residential uh, consumption due to work from home policies, other public health measures in the year that required individuals to isolate in their homes. Next on capital, which uh, can be seen on schedule two, which is page nine of the statements. As at December 31st, 25.1 million, which is 72% of the approved capital budget had been spent. Of the 28% that remained unspent, 7.2, which is 21%, was approved to be carried forward on uh, February 22nd, 2022, at the regular council meeting. Approximately 2.5 million of the unspent amount represents savings on various projects. Savings were most notably realized on renewal programs, as well as the Range Road 241 construction project. As these projects are funded from reserves and offsite levies respectively, these unspent funds may remain in each of these accounts and would be available to fund future renewal and offsite levy projects. Next for the city's reserve balances, which is note 10 or page 23. The 2020 municipal operating budget required reserve draws of approximately a million dollars, which is approximately 400,000 under the budgeted amount of 1.4 million. The decrease in this draw was from, from phase in and contingency funds that were not required in the year. Some specific one time operating projects also did not draw from reserves. These funds are requested to be carried forward in the 2022 budget year. From a capital reserve perspective, 3.1 million was required to fund capital projects in the 2021 year, and 600,000 of pay as you go funding was utilized. No reserve draw was required for utility operations in 2021. Next, for some recommended transfers, uh, which is or note eight would have the amounts, which is page 22. Administration is recommending that the municipal operating surplus of 183,000 be transferred to the parks, playground, and playfield reserve to bring this balance in compliance with the city's reserve policy. 
at your end, all other reserve balances are within optimal balance ranges as specified in council policy C40. Independent of the municipal operating surplus is the net library operating surplus of 15,000 that administration is recommending remain in the library's unrestricted surplus account and to be allocated at the library board's discretion. Administration has also recommended the transfer of the accumulated surplus from prior years for the library. This balance is currently 162,000, which is currently sitting in the city's library building reserve. This amount is recommended to be transferred to the library's unrestricted surplus account with that 15,000 we discussed before. Administration has recommended the transfer of $22,000 from this library building reserve to the city's facility renewal reserve. This 22,000 reflects the city's total contributions to the library building reserve as the library building is a city owned asset and would complete the consolidation of the city's facility renewal reserve funds. Finally, administration recommends that the utility operating surplus of 608,000 be transferred to the utility reserve. This reserve will remain in optimal range as specified by uh, the council policy C40. Financial implications of, of everything in the report as stated previously, the net impact of the 2021 year is that net municipal operating surplus of 183,000. The transfer of this amount to the parks reserve will increase the balance from a deficit of 9,000 to a positive amount of 174,000. After these adjustments recommended for the library's operating surplus and transfers from the building reserve, the library's unrestricted surplus account will increase from the 30,000, which it has carried forward year over year, to 208,000. In addition, the city generated a net surplus in its utility operations of 608,000, as we discussed before, and is recommended to stay or be transferred to its specific utility reserve. The balance of this reserve will increase from 7.4 million to 8 million. This concludes or concludes my report. And at this time, I'll turn the floor back to council and I'm able to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blanco. Uh, council will proceed with the questions of Mr. Blanco. Uh, after questions are done, the, the recommendation we put on the screen, we're going to look at voting on all four recommendations at once. Unless council, a member of council feels they want to pick one of those recommendations off and vote on it separately, we can do that. So when I ask the question, that's the time to take one of those recommendations off to be voted separately. That's how we'll proceed. So I'll begin with questions from council for Mr. DeBlanco. Councilman Newkirk, Steve, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. DeBlanco, for the presentation. Um, page 21 or 77 of 132 speaks to long-term debt and debt limits. Um, just a specific question around the long-term debt. Uh, last council meeting, there was we saw a $2.3 million increase that was suggested to be by debenture um, for the uh, total of 7.5 to the support the Frank Frone school site. Is that number reflected in number six here? So thanks for the question through to Councillor Van Newkirk. No, that balance would not be reflected in here as there was no amount board just yet. It's, it's included in the capital budget for 2022, but as at December 31st, 2021, no amount was, has been drawn on that yet. Oh, I see. So the, it, that'll land on next year, so. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Seeing no further questions from anybody on the council. Thank you very much. Would you please put the motion on the screen, Ms. Winter, if you could please, the five recommendations. And I will ask a member of council to move uh, item 6B. Councilor Tessier, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. I'll move that the motion is as presented. Is that okay if you go through each one by, do we have to verbalize each one? Is that preferred? Or can we simply, Ms. Winter, what's the most expedient way to do this? It definitely won't be expedient the way that I wish for it to be done. I would verbalize each motion as it sits. Done deal. Thank you. I thought that'd be the case, Mr. Chesley. I tried, but rule, rules are rules. So please, please proceed. No, I, I attempted to go my route and we'll go this one. Um, <laughs> I move that the 2021 audited financial statements as set out in the attachment one of the April 26, 2022, 2021 audited financial statements report be approved and that the transfer of the 2021 net municipal 
operating surplus in the amount of 182,933 to the parks, playground and play field renewal reserve to be approved. And that the transfer of the 2021 net utility operating surplus in the amount of $607,621 to the utility reserve be approved. And that a transfer in the amount of $162,369 from the library building reserve to the library's unrestricted surplus account to be approved. And that the transfer in the amount of 22,000 from the library building reserve to the facility renewal or yeah, renewal reserve to be approved. Nice little short story. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Labor needs both six proclamations. Yeah. Kind of family, eh? <laughs> yeah. So, Council, I will call any questions on this motion. And seeing none, I will ask Council to vote accordingly. And that motion is carried unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Blanco, Mr. for your attendance again to the Council. See you next year in Curtis next meeting. Thank you very much. Next on the agenda is 6C, Report on Lighting for Tennis Courts and Skateboard Park. And I believe, uh, I, who knows? Yes, great. I had Excellent it right. work there. Thank you very much. Please begin your presentation. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm here today to present the report on tennis court and skateboard park lighting. This report is to be received for information. So this report was based on a motion made by council. And the purpose of this report is to provide council with information on the potential benefits and costs for the supplied installation of lighting at the tennis courts and skateboard park. The current state of the tennis courts and skateboard park lighting is that there's no permanent lighting in place and users currently rely on the ambient natural light to use these facilities. In terms of potential benefits of adding lighting, one benefit could be that the addition of lighting could increase the ability for residents to access these facilities for extended hours in the evenings during the shoulder seasons of late spring and early fall. Lighting these areas may also increase safety and security of these areas and may help keep vandalism and other unlawful activities under control. Another potential benefit could be that as younger children in Beaumont transition into their teenage years, more amenity areas that are safe and well lit could benefit the community. It would benefit all ages, but we just want to highlight that there are a lot of young children that are moving into the teenage years fairly soon. However, the flip side is that increased use in lighting at later hours may also lead to increased loitering and undesirable activities, you know, again, by various age groups, but potentially, you know, the younger crowd. So in that sense, lighting could be a little bit of a double-edged sword. So if public or if permanent lighting is to be pursued in this area, public engagement would be advisable to determine the following. So impacts to surrounding residents. The north and west side currently have residents, so we would wanna evaluate the impact of lighting on them. We'd also wanna confirm the desire for lighting in these areas. And if shoulder season usage of the tennis courts and skateboard park is actually desirable and needed, and how many people actually want this. So that is something that should be considered as May and September are still fairly chilly in the evenings. So although it may seem like a lot of people will use it, if the weather isn't that favorable, how many people will actually use it? So we probably wanna do some engagement around that. In terms of lighting types, we could do traditional permanent lights or we could do some rental lighting and some of the different options. These are not an exhaustive list. But some of the options that we're presenting would be permanent traditional lighting. So this would be similar to parking lot lighting or the lighting that was installed at the ice rinks. So this type of lighting is more traditional floodlight design. So it's just meant to light as much area as possible. It's not meant to be any type of focused light. So this lighting we would estimate would cost approximately 150,000 for both the tennis courts and skateboard park. Another style of lighting that could be considered is permanent professional sport lighting. So this would be similar to the lighting installed at the Four Seasons Park last year. Now the technology and design of these lights allows for controlled light instead of flood lights. So this allows the light to be directed and focused on the amenity areas to ensure that there is minimal light pollution. So this would be a sport level of lighting, not a safety level of lighting. So this would mean that it would be designed to have equally distributed light and it would minimize shadows and it would really be that high end 
professional sport level of lighting. Now, obviously this type of lighting has a hefty price tag. We're estimating the total cost would be approximately 550,000. Now, another option we could consider if we wanted to you know, try out lighting would be rental lighting. So that would be either diesel or solar powered options. And we would estimate the cost at approximately 30 to 40,000 a year. And this is based on three months of use for approximately three hours in the evening. So these are high level estimates and quantities. If lighting of these areas is to be further considered, we could then consider detailed design and detail costing. So we did have an attachment in the report, which you saw to, that showed some photos of lighting to provide some context, but otherwise, thank you for your time and attention. <clears throat> and I will now open the floor to any questions. Thank you very much. Council, questions? Councilman Cook, Kat, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so with any of the lighting options, can they can it, they be programmed to whatever time we need like, and then can that be easily changed? So through the mayor to Councilor McCook, yes. I mean, all lights come with a variety of, you know, either we could do the auto sensor, the solar sensor, or we could do a timer option. So yeah, typically lights have that option. Okay. And one more question. Um, were septed principles considered when choosing the appropriate amount of lighting for the courts or, cause we talked about like the sport level, which would basically just shine on the courts versus the safety kind of lighting. Um, or will that be something that's more considered during like a public engagement? So through the mayor to council Mohook, that detailed design would be considered in a further step. Right now this was high, like the sport lighting was considered at a sport level, mm -hmm. but the estimate for the permanent light poles was you know, more of an estimate, an estimate for just general lighting of the area. Okay, thank you. That's it, Mayor. Thank Welcome. you. Great. Thank you, Kat. Councilor Barnhart, Kathy, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you very much for the work you've done on this report. It's great to have this information. Um, if we receive this as information, is the administration going to proceed to public engagement, or do you need a further motion to do that? Through the Mayor to Councilor Barnhart, I believe a further motion would be required. Okay, so at this point, you're asking council to decide lighting or no lighting, or you're asking us to decide to take it to the next step to find out what the community thinks. I can help with that. We're just being asked to accept this report for information for right now. No decision being required this evening. You asked for a decision. Well, I understand that, but if we wanted to go further, we'd have, the answer was we'd need to say we wanted her to take it further. Yes. I am actually, sorry, sorry, the mayor. I'm actually going to direct that back to Aaron, my director. Maybe chime in. Ms. Lorecki? Or Mr. Blanco? <laughs> Ms. Winter wants to say something. Okay. Ms. Winter? Thank you, Mayor. I can actually answer that question for Councillor Barnhart. Um, if Council wishes to move forward with making a decision this evening, we could um, have a separate motion ready other than accepting it for information. That's just a recommendation from administration. So if Council wishes to look at this further, we could look at putting up another motion. Okay. Depending on Council's desire. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think it's good information to have, and I'm not I'm not at the point where I think we, we have the money to spend on this, um, but we heard from in the open forum that there are citizens as well are looking for some lighting to extend the use of the pickleball court. And uh, I, I, I just think if this, if nothing happens, we just accept it for information, that means nothing will happen to pursue this any further. So that's my concern. And <laughs> Anxious to hear what the rest of council thinks on this, but I mean, it wasn't my request for this information that came from other councillors, but I, I am hearing now from the community that that's not a, it, it's not out of the realm of possibility to have some type of lighting there certain times of the year. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to know what the next steps are. That, that's basically my question. Okay. Thank you. I understand your question. And council, please have your mics closer to your mouth or speak louder, one of the two. Would be appreciated. Thank you. Uh, Council McGough Swain, Sam, you have the floor, followed by Councillor Miller, followed by Councillor Van Newkirk. Sam. Thank you, and, and thanks very much for the comprehensive report. Um, just to, I want to speak to your question, Councillor Barnhart. So today I was prepared to accept this as information. Um, I, I, I wouldn't want to go further on an engagement piece yet. Uh, you know, this is a capital ask. We've set up a process um, where we're going to, as Council, going to talk kind of in, in Q2 around the different capital items that are potentially going to come up at budget. 
Um, and I would like to, before making a decision on whether we go and ask administration to do engagement on that, I, I think we should have that conversation first and see where that fits with, within our piece. I, I agree, it would be great information to have. Um, I just, one of the, my thought process around setting up that um, that budget conversation in advance of the budget was to, so that we wouldn't have the, the, these one-off type, type conversations. So um, I, I don't want to speak to a motion that hasn't been put on the floor yet, but um, I think you're picking up what I'm putting down here. Uh, I, I'd be prepared to accept it as information today, um, but certainly would like to have this conversation um, uh, when we get into that um, and, and that budget process. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Sam. I understand what you're saying. Appreciate that. Councilor Miller, Ashley, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. I was going to kind of just reiterate the same thing. I think this is something that um, given the response from residents that we've seen without public engagement so far, we do need to explore it, but I think we should compile it with what we are going to in um, the capital asks. So um, I do just want to highlight a couple things. Um, Mr. Gatzkoff had asked before um, in his open forum. Um, I see you have included the options for solar powered. He did mention that. So that's um, a benefit. I don't know if he's um, if he's watching, but I do like that you had highlighted that. And I believe um, there was one other thing in here. Oh, the motion sensor. Uh, I believe that's also highlighted as well. So um, I look forward to uh, the options on those. I'm not so convinced. Uh, I don't want to get into debate, obviously, that we need it for the skate park at this point, and if that's a good idea, but um, I accepted it as information myself. So thanks. Thank you, Ashley. Councilman Newkirk, Steve, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think the report like this is really helpful as we uh, consider and think big picture about a few things in the community and uh, move towards a, a June kind of pre-capital review and then budget in the fall. And for me, there's a couple of things to uh, consider as well on top of what's been said, and that is the, uh, the, the, the space planning and space review of all the uh, uh, city owned and civic buildings and facilities and civic owned land that I, th I think is expected in Q2. Um, and then there's also the, uh, our places and play master plan, you know, which actually, as I pointed out earlier, uh, shows a pickleball expansion in 2021. And I know the, the dates are off a little bit there, but it does give some prioritization to, um, you know, some things over another at that point in time when that report was made. So, um, I think that the lighting considerations would change and the numbers would change if we were making the court bigger. So, you know, if the land around it used, gets used for something else or the courts are made bigger or anything like that, that will change all of these numbers. So um, uh, today I'm ex uh, willing to accept this information. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor, I see Councillor Tessa, you had your button on. Did you, you uh, took it off? Go ahead, Renee, you have the floor. Thanks so much. And just a comment on the, the timer and the motion sensors, just a personal comment. I think if we were to go motion sensors, you still have to have it on a timer because, you know, if there's kids playing or going in there at 1 a.m. and everyone walking by, it keeps coming on and off. Uh, just a comment for that. And then, yeah, it would be good to look at the costs of expansion versus lighting too. And, you know, which one you put ahead of the other. So, yeah, thanks again. Interesting stuff. So looking forward to where it takes us. Thank you, Councillor. One quick question for myself, and I'll ask for the motion to accept report as information. Um, the last uh, temporary rental lighting was looking at thirty to 40000 a year. I'm assuming that we would rent those units on a total rental basis. Um, it is possible to have information coming back to Council at a later time to see, could we purchase those units, as opposed to doing the, the tall light towers that require a lot more installation could we purchase a, a temporary one and then the picture and just have that to move around as we needed to. So it wasn't part of the report. I'm not sure I want to ask for any more information, but that's something we could get at a later time. That would be appreciated. So at this point, I'll ask for a motion from council to accept the report as presented. Once it's on the screen for us there, Councillor Miller. Go ahead, sure. Ashley. Thank you, Mayor. I move that the April 26, 2022 report, tennis court and skateboard park lighting be received for information. Thank you, Councillor. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll ask council to vote accordingly. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, council. Thank you, Poonam. Great, thank you, everyone. Thank you, council. 
Our next order of business on our agenda is 6D, Mayor Daniluk, motion following notice, short-term rentals. I'll wait for motion to be put on the screen. Thank you. I move that by the end of the third quarter of 2022, administration prepare a report on short-term rentals, Airbnb, specifically on an outline of current standards and regulations for short-term rentals, if any, in Beaumont, and a list of comparable communities and how they regulate short-term rentals. I'll speak to my motion, if I may. Council looking for support for information purposes to address some concerns from residents regarding homes that are being used for rental purposes that sometimes tend to be uh, less than well maintained. There's issues with uh, with parting and so on. Um, that's the concerns of some residents. Other residents are quite fine with it. So I want to get a report from council or for council to determine um, if we have any concerns regarding Airbnb. Do we need to um, look at a bylaw in the future? The report will give us the groundwork to consider any future steps. So with that, I'll take any questions from council if they have some for me before I ask you to vote accordingly. Councilor Mokoff Swains, Sam, you have the floor. Yeah, yes, sorry, and, and thanks for putting this um, this up here. And just correct me if I'm wrong, because when I first read it, I had no idea what you meant by short-term rentals, but I, I see now you've got Airbnb in brackets, um, and I assume that this will cover all of them, um, not just Airbnb. Um, so I, I, my, my question, I, I think, is clarified. Um, yeah, the, the initial motion didn't speak to that, but th this is what you're talking about here is, yes. uh, or, yeah, like basically subletting out your property. Exactly. Also. And for example, would we require that to be considered a business? And would it require a business license? That report, this report may tell us that information on what we do and have in Beaumont now, what other jurisdictions do regarding short-term rentals within residential areas. That's the intent information. Yeah. Okay, Th thank you. And I'll be prepared to support this, uh, this motion. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councilman Newkirk, Steve, you have the floor. Yeah, Mayor, um, I hadn't thought about this until you brought the notice of motion forward. So thank you for that. I think that Beaumont would be fairly proactive in, in looking at this. I know that other communities have had to be reactive on this. Uh, you know, short-term rentals have become a burden or a problem before this was put forward. So I think this is a, a proactive look into what's happening around us. And there are quite a few examples out there of um, bylaws and policies and um, how it, how it, connects to business licenses and all those kinds of things. So there's there's quite a bit of information out there for administration to glean on. So I think this is important and uh, happy to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And one last thing too, just to be clear, uh, Council members, uh, this was brought to my attention by, by a couple of residents who had some concerns and I discussed it with them in administration. I thought it's worthwhile to have a report for information purposes and see where, where it takes us. So see no further questions from Council. Thank you. I will ask for you. Oh, sorry, Councillor Tessier. Uh, go ahead, Renee. Um, obviously in support of this, but would something like this be going into the land use bylaw or would it be a separate report coming back and if it were to move forward, yeah. where would it go? My understanding would be would be a, a separate bylaw. However, the report will tell us if we are looking to proceed, how best to proceed is my understanding from talking to administration on a future report coming back. So I think that that'll probably answer your question for this evening. Perfect, thanks. Thank you, I appreciate that. Seeing no further questions, Council, I'll ask you to vote accordingly on the motion. And that carries unanimously. Thank you, Council. Next order of business is the bylaws 7B, bylaw 1013 22, 2022 property and tax supplementary property tax report. And I believe. Um, Mr. Blanco, are you speaking to this this evening? Thank you. Please proceed, Curtis. Good evening again. Uh, once again, Curtis Blanco, Director of Finance for the City, back again with a report to present or present the uh, 2022 property tax and supplementary property tax bylaw. At the December 14th, 2021 council meeting, council approved the 2022 budget and the financial and capital plans. This budget included a 2.4% property tax levy increase subject to adjustments based on finalized property assessments. And then at the April 12th, 2022 council meeting, uh, administration presented amendments to the approved budget, which included increased municipal 
uh, tax revenue due to real assessment growth of 271,000 and increased requisition tax amounts of 291,400. This 2022 property tax and supplementary property tax bylaw has been prepared based on this amended budget and the finalized assessment numbers. The property tax rates presented in the attached bylaw will achieve municipal tax revenue in the amount of $23,420,700, as well as requisition tax revenue in the amount of $8,308,679. Um, and those amounts go towards the Alberta School Foundation Fund, uh, the opted out school board, such as St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, the Leduc Regional Housing Foundation, as well as uh, a small amount requisition for designated industrial property tax in the city. Um, although the blended tax levy, which is net of growth has increased 2.4%, the impact of the increase between properties will vary uh, depending on how an, an individual's property has, has either increased or decreased compared to the average in the city. Once again, the variation will depend on various factors, including assessment value changes. Um, while these assessment changes do not affect the overall budget, they can cause tax shifting between properties and property types. Financial implications, approval of this bylaw will allow the city to levy tax revenue totaling the amount uh, stated before and included, including revenue attributable, attributable to real property growth in the amount of 871,000. This amount includes an estimate of 72,990 from annex properties that's subject to Leduc County approving their tax bylaw um, and an estimate of 110,785 for supplemental taxes and any other adjustments in the year. The average property will see an increase of 2.4% on the municipal portion of their tax notice. This concludes my report and can take any questions council may have, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blanco. Questions from councillors on Mr. Blanco's presentation on this property tax bylaw. Seeing none, Ms. Winter, if I may, um, I noticed on my agenda, it didn't say first, second, third reading on 7B, but on the recommendation on uh, page one of Mr. Blanco's report, it recommends first, second, and third reading. So can you please advise how I should proceed on this? Make sure I get it right, please. There you go. Thank you, Mayor. Administration is looking for all three readings and unanimous consent for third this evening on this bylaw. Okay, so we can simply go through uh, first, second, and third reading as per the recommendation on the screen. Correct. We do Thank need you. separate motions for each one, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further questions for Mr. DeBlanco, uh, I will ask a councillor to move first reading. Councillor Newkirk. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I would move that bylaw 1013-22-2022 property tax and supplementary property tax bylaw be given first reading. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Discussion on the motion, Council? Seeing none, I'll ask you to vote accordingly. And that passes unanimously. Thank you, Council. Is a member of Council willing to move second reading? Councillor Barnard, Kathy, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. I move that bylaw 1013-22 be given second reading. Thank you, Councillor. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Council, I'll ask you to vote on second reading. That also carries unanimously. Thank you, Council. And I'll get this one right this time. Uh, we're going to ask a Councillor to move, be considered for third reading. Is there a member of Council willing to make that motion? Councillor Miller, Ashley, you have the floor. Thank you, I move that bylaw 1013-2022 be considered for third reading. Thank you, Councillor. Discussion? Seeing none, Council, please vote. Thank you, that carried unanimously. And lastly, is a member of Council willing to move third reading? Councillor McCook, Kat, you have the floor. Thank you, I move that bylaw 1013-22 be given third reading. Thank you, Councillor. Discussion on the motion, seeing none. Council, please vote accordingly. And that also carries unanimously. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Mr. Blanco for your presentation this evening. With that, we will now move into section eight of our agenda, Councillor inquiries, responses, 
and reports. Do any council members wish to make an inquiry, a response, or report? I'll begin with Councillor Monkoff Swain, followed by Councillor Barnhart, followed by Councillor Van Newkirk. Sam, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. And my, my, my question uh, is for Mr. Souter, and, and um, it'll pop up on the screen here. Um, so I'll read the question into record and, and recognize, uh, Mr. Souter, you're not going to have the answer tonight. Um, so just acknowledge that up front, but uh, I'm asking that you please provide information on any restrictions for participants and spectators attending and using the new multi-use field. Um, and just to provide the background on it, you know, the community is obviously very excited about, um, you know, checking out some events down there, but, you know, hearing some, some grumblings through the community around, you know, not being able to bring chairs down, you can't bring, you can't have coffee on the field and, um, and, you know, there's limits around, you know, how close your kids can be, all that sort of stuff. And so I, I'm sure a lot of it is anecdotal and, and I'm looking for you to, to provide some, some more, um, so the facts that I can share back um, so that uh, obviously the community can enjoy this the space, obviously recognizing it's a brand new field. We want to look after it, um, but we also want to make sure that it has the community feel there. So I uh, appreciate that. that, um, that uh, I just want to provide that additional context. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Barnhart, Kathy, you're next. You have the floor. Th thank you, Mayor. Uh, I have an inquiry and then I have uh, an item to mention in reports. You'd like me to separate the two and just do the inquiry and then come do the back to me first, after? please. Then we'll do okay. reports. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and I did give the uh, CAO a uh, heads up about this one. Um, I would appreciate, and it, I don't need the answer right now, but I would appreciate coming back to council. Um, an update on the status of derelict buildings that we have on the southeast quadrant uh, of Beaumont, right on Route 625. There's a number of structures there that are really looking quite run down and graffiti is now there and getting worse. So I, before something happens and someone gets hurt, I like to know what the, uh, what if anything the city can do or has done for that property. So that's my inquiry. And where's it located again, please? If you could clarify. On 625, there's a, I think there's four or five, maybe six structures there that are vacant, derelict buildings. Okay. And there's graffiti quite, it's, it, you haven't driven that way, I, I imagine, because you can't miss it. I have it for a couple of days it. now, so. Uh, I come down the, you know, the, the side road and then I, I head to the west and every time I do it, I keep thinking, I have got to raise that. That is so, just, sorry. it's an eyesore. North side of 65 or south side of 65? North, side, north side. On, on, well, on our. Yeah, okay. I'm just curious for well. clarifying. Thank you. Yeah, no, take a ride over. You'll see what I mean. Okay, thank you. Councilman Newkirk, Steve, you have the floor for inquiries. Yeah, you bet. Um, some context around uh, my inquiry here tonight. So the inquiry is this. Um, please provide an update on the status and timeline of the required street curb and landscape repairs on 50th Street northbound uh, following the servicing of the new Larev area in late fall 2021. Um, so that work, um, just for context there, uh, for council and the community, that work occurred right up against the edge of winter um, and uh, the construction was um, prolonged and it made those, uh, those repairs had to be made in haste. And so there's some curbing that needs to be repaired, some landscape and the, the patches on the actual asphalt are, are not very good. So um, just looking for a timeline and a status update on that from administration. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Seeing no further inquiries, we'll move to responses and reports. So, Councillor Barnard, you mentioned you have a report you'd like to mention. So, Kathy, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And this is just a quick reminder in case councillors may have forgotten. I know, Mayor, I believe you've registered for the municipal conversation that the Leduc Regional Housing Foundation is having on May 16th. Yes. And I, the notice has gone out again. We, we sent a save the date out quite a while ago, and I just thought it might have slipped from the radar of council. But uh, just a uh, a reminder that uh, talking within the region about affordable housing is has become more and more of an issue in terms of uh, uh, the provincial government providing opportunities, I could put it that way, uh, others may not put it in the same light, to look at a needs assessment for housing in our region. So uh, I, I think it's important for all councillors to be brought up to speed on what's happening. And, and City of Beaumont is participating uh, administration is participating directly and making um, presentations on affordable housing on our strategy. So I thought it would be very important if we could attend. And uh, it's in the uh, Denim Inn in uh, Leduc. It's an in-person event. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I look forward to attending that with you on May 16th. That's Wednesday morning, I believe. Uh, are there any further responses or reports from council members? 
Thank you. I'll update you on a couple of things briefly. Uh, as you may recall already, we've been in office uh, six months as of yesterday, and it's been a very fast six months. I can't believe how fast it's gone, honestly. It's been a blur in a good way, but it's been a blur nonetheless. So thank you for all your work, administration, the last six months. It's gone very well. Lots on the go. Lots still, still to come. And so next six months will be as busy as the first six months, I'm sure. And we'll be having Christmas around the corner very quickly. So not too soon, I hope. We got to get some golfing in first. <laughs> get some golfing in first. And having said that, I had my first uh, mayor's town hall last evening at the high school. At approximately 30 residents came out. I did about a half hour to 40 minute presentation and took questions afterwards. There a number of questions from residents and a good general discussion. A couple of counts were able to make it with their schedules. A couple of you weren't, and that's totally fine. We're all very busy people, and you've got families to, to take part of it as well, too. So um, next one will be roughly six months from now. Overall, it was a pretty good response overall, and I look forward to the next one roughly six months from now into, into October, early November, somewhere in that time frame. Thank you, Council. And so next on our agenda is our CAO update. Mr. Schwartz, you have the floor. Did I hear Councillor McCook say we wanted summer before Christmas? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, thought I was losing my mind there. <laughs> <clears throat> it's going to go by fast. Okay, I've got, I've got a few things. I'll be very quick here. Uh, I wanted to uh, acknowledge a couple of responses from the Beaumont Fire Services. On, on Easter Monday, there was a structure fire on Range Road 243 and uh, 505. And uh, there was no injuries. We had more than 12 volunteers who showed up and they worked for eight hours with an assist by uh, Leduc County. Nobody was, uh, everybody was extracted, whoever was there. There was renters in the top floor and the bottom floor. Um, so again, thank you very much to, uh, to Beaumont Fire Services. And then yesterday afternoon, you may have noticed that we had a wildland fire uh, in our southeast corner. Uh, so they responded to that. It had a potential to really go sideways being the wind. And uh, I know Councillor Tessier, you would have choose, when I spoke to the captain this morning or to that fire chief this morning, he talked about rolling up there. And when you roll up to those wildland fires, you don't know what you're getting. And you got wind going everywhere and they're usually hard to, to get under control. Um, they had the fire out at 7.30 and then headed back, back to the, the hall to uh, clean up all the equipment and uh, get back in service. And we were back in service by 2100, by nine o'clock. Uh, again, thank you. We had uh, firefighters who were coming back. So it was the end of the day. So they were coming back from the regular jobs, coming back to Beaumont, driving directly to the hall, grabbing their gear and then driving down to the, the site and, and jumping in to help. So that's pretty awesome. We, uh, we had a lot of people who showed up and they all stuck around afterwards to, to clean up. So thank you very much to Beaumont Fire Services. A couple other items, and then I got, I'll send you an email because there's a number of things that, that I want to share with you around CCBCC bookings, around street sweeping. I'm going to talk about street sweeping in a second. Um, what, but before that, I'll just one more thing is StatsCan is releasing their demographic uh, profile data tomorrow. So I'm really going to be excited to see what that looks like for the city of Beaumont. And, and as soon as we get that, we'll uh, definitely get something into council's hands and out on social media. And street sweeping, uh, talk to... Uh, uh, Aaron, earlier today, uh, we're continuing on, on our P1s, which are essentially 50th Street and 50th Ave, and then we start moving into different quadrants of the city. So the first one that they're moving into is Colonial, the northeast quadrant. Immediate, immediately after that, they go southeast and southwest, and then northwest. We rotate that every year so that it's fair. It takes about a week to do a quadrant, weather permitting. So people, well, we're signing it up out there. Uh, you saw the markers on 50th. Uh, it, it's They're doing a great job, and it sure, sure looks good out there. So wanted to to uh, pass that along and, and ask for our motorist uh, patience as well. And as I said, I got a, a number of other things that are uh, bookings and, uh, and the dog park and, and, and those types of things. We're, we're beginning to take uh, um, bookings for the multi-use field, effective May 1st. We have switched from construction to operation, so we have taken it over, so that's pretty exciting. And that's all I had for tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Schwartz. Appreciate that. The next item on our agenda is number 10, notices of motion. All right, any council wishes to make a notice of motion this evening? Not that I'm aware of, unless something else has popped up. No. Thank you, council, appreciate that. Uh, next on our agenda is closed session. We've already done that on the consent agenda. And I believe that brings us to the conclusion of our agenda this evening. So unless I missed something, Ms. Winter, on our agenda, I think we're good to adjourn. Thank you very much. Uh, at 821, we are adjourned. Thank you, council and administration.